It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we are back in Daniel 7. And if you watched last week, you know that we did not even get through the beasts. <laughs> it's halfway through the beasts, not even touched really on the horns very much. But, uh, but we're, we're getting to, there. Yeah. I th- because I th- this is such a rich section of prophecy, the mm-hmm. imagery here is so pregnant with meaning that it's difficult Mm -hmm. to uh, just do this in the span of one program and say, okay, there you got it. It's all summarized for you. It's impossible. The the courses that I've taken in the past, and of course, when I also studied when I was a kid, I've been at this a long time. um, It was, here's what they are. Here's the chart. And Mm -hmm. then it moved on. Right. There's so much in this stuff. Right. The deeper we go into this, especially by applying the divine council worldview and the understanding that what we're looking at here are supernatural entities and not necessarily human rulers. It um, makes it that much more difficult. It's like, you know, the onion peeling. You never get to the middle of the onion. So, you know, if you need to pause this and go get yourself a cup of coffee or a hot chocolate or some tea like I've got and, uh, you know, just sit there, put your feet up and go with us because... We may go in a direction that we don't even plan at this point because that's how we work. Mm-hmm. That's how we roll. So, well, Daniel last week, seven. we talked about the two, the first two beasts, the lion with eagle's wings, which again, the consensus among scholars is that represented the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, followed by the bear, the Medo Persian Empire, led right. by Cyrus the Great, followed by, you know, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and Darius, and right. so forth. The third beast, beginning of Daniel 7, verse 6. After this, I looked and behold another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back and the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. And that l- represents Greece. Um, you know, that, that again, if you were taking courses back in the day, you would say, okay, here's what this means. Here are the bullet points. Move mm-hmm. on. The whole miracle of Alexander. Yeah. That really is a spirit behind him. You know, Alexander claimed, his father claimed, Mm -hmm. to be descended from Zeus. Yeah. Yeah, there's not uh, unusual in the ancient Near East for kings to claim royal, uh, or rather divine ancestry in order to justify their reign. Oh, exactly. And that was fake news. And it got, you know, oh gosh, we better worship him. There was an entity working with him and through him. Right, A demonic spirit of some sort Mm -hmm. that was, yeah... You look at the the accomplishments of Alexander, who by the age of 30 had conquered more territory than just about anyone mm-hmm. ever in history. Um, what motivates you to do something like that? I mean, you know, for me, a nice, relaxing Saturday is sitting and just studying, researching, whatever. Getting out and traveling halfway across the world on the back of a horse, camping out every night... And then going to, you know, knowing that the natives in the land you're visiting aren't going to welcome you as a tourist and show you all the sites. They're going to try to stab you to death. Having and your why men, would you do that? Having your men who have wives back home. Yes. Marry local wives. Yes, yes. That's one reason I think there's a theory that Alexander was murdered mm. because his generals weren't very happy about his, uh, the way he was running things there at the end. Yeah. He sort of sat down and said, okay, done, put my feet up, and I'm just going to go native. But the thing that's remarkable here, of course, is that Daniel saw this coming in advance. And we'll say again, we can document and say that with confidence because we know that Daniel was translated into the Septuagint, was translated into Greek 
before some of the events that are prophesied, specifically the wars between the kings of the north, the uh, Seleucid kings of Syria, mm -hmm. and the kings of the south, the uh, kings of the Ptolemaic kings of Egypt. It's like so, they wrote a novel in advance. They wrote a novel in advance. Yes. Very, very precise. It's, it, or so, a news report in advance. But um, the, uh, the four heads of the leopard... The representing the four successor kings. Maybe the ones kingdoms. who killed him. <laughs> May have been the ones who killed him, yes. So um, that, uh, a, a, and the leopard probably referring to the speed at which Greece moved from Macedonia. Uh, well, we say Greece, but it was actually the Macedonian kingdom that uh, conquered everything from, from the, the so Aegean Sea to, to India. The fact that he moved his armies that fast. Yeah. It was, he rivaled what Xerxes had done. And that was and one of the reasons it. he did that, because Xerxes had taken over the Mediterranean. Yeah, and, and he exceeded what he did. And yes. There, there were successor kingdoms, Greek kingdoms in places like what, Bactria, which is like what, northeast Afghanistan? Yes. That lasted for centuries after yes. the Greek kingdoms in northern India that lasted for centuries. It's just an amazing thing. Um, but and then, the spirits behind him. Right. Why did that spirit want to take down the Prince of Persia? That's a really good question. We see the reference to the Prince of Persia in and the, uh, Daniel. And the Prince of Greece. Right, where uh, Daniel is uh, probably Gabriel, if I remember correctly. It was Dan uh, yeah, Gabriel, yes, yeah. who, who came and visited him and, and uh, told him that the, uh, he'd been withstood by the, uh, the Prince of Persia. Um, for for 21 days yes and that michael had to come and help him but uh, the the prophecy then seems to suggest that a spirit behind the greek kingdom alexander came mm -hmm. and and took down the uh, the prince of persia so it would suggest that there is some infighting amongst the the, the fallen realm absolutely now if you're wondering what these entities are how they came to be here after babel happened the Lord sent down 70 or 72, depending upon the translation, of his angels. And they were each going to a tribe. Now, the number 70 just means the complete set. So it could be that there were 700. We don't know. But every tongue of these scattered, you know, one language, now every language group had its own Elohim, its own uh, angel, if you want to put it that way, sent down by the Lord. These were watcher class entities. Mm -hmm. These were very powerful entities. And I think the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece are two of these entities. I agree. And all of them decided to go native and they fell. They mm -hmm. rebelled. And just as in human politics, where you may get members of a political party who are all united against the other party, they are fighting within their own party for control of that party. Mm -hmm. You know, when okay, when we take down the the king or the president, uh, who's going to be the next one sitting in his chair? <laughs> and they've got a chief whip that goes around and and sort of intimidates <laughs> the ones who are voting against it yes. to join the crowd. Put a bit of stick about. Yes. Make them jump. jump. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that uh, uh, again, likely a uh, reference to the. Um, uh, the, the kingdom of the Greeks, and then the fourth beast that Daniel saw in Daniel 7, beginning at uh, verse 7, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. This is the origin of the ten horns seen on the beast in Revelation 13, the Antichrist. Okay. In the Septuagint, it's just a tiny bit different. After this, after this one, I looked and beheld a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong, and its teeth were of iron, devouring and crushing to atoms. Hmm. And it trampled the remainder with its feet. And it was altogether different from the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. The, crushing to atoms absolutely erasing yeah. what was before. And v viewers might be surprised seeing the word atoms turning up in a translation that was done uh, more, you know, before the birth of Jesus. Yeah, but there were we, It is a Greek word, and there were Greek philosophers who mm -hmm. postulated that there was an, a, 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 like a minute particle that was the basis mm -hmm. of all matter. And yeah, they, it that, just means without division. Right. So that's, uh, that's where that came from. But... Um, 
The, the other thing, about the, considering the horns, I'm, I'm, wheels, with it, wheels and wheels going here at the same time, and the, the <laughs> gears are grinding. Tea, the gears are grinding. Um, verse 8 is, is interesting because this, this hints at, uh, again, some of this infighting taking place amongst the spirit oh, realm. Oh, yes, I know. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Mm -hmm. And we, Now, we talked about that before, that little horn. Scholars have noted that, and then in Daniel 8, it continues talking about how it uh, is blaspheming, and it yes. makes war against the saints, which, uh, again, mm -hmm. is a reference to supernatural entities, yes. watchers, not... Uh, humans exactly, and this but, isn't all ready, but not yet. I, yes, but the the parallel between this and the descriptions in Greek religion of the chaos god Typhon mm -hmm. is another reason we believe that this little horn, which scholars agree is a representation in the Old Testament of the Antichrist, um, that's the eighth king who is of the seven mm -hmm. in Revelation seventeen, um, that he is the chaos. God, the chaos monster, Leviathan, who is subdued in Genesis 1, verse 2, when God is hovering over the face of the deep, hovering over the waters. Um, we see references in um, Isaiah that uh, ultimately on that day, the day of the Lord, he will crush the heads of Leviathan. Yes. But in Psalm, uh, was it 78, I believe, where he uh, makes reference to it, he, he uh, my God is, is of old, and, um, or is it Psalm 74? <laughs> Yes, my, my God, my King, is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea, the Yam, mm -hmm. by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. Um, again, that's an already, but not yet. It is. There is a myth. It goes way, way back. An ancient Mycenaean myth of a multi-headed, probably seven-headed dragon. Really? Called the Lemayan Hydra. Oh, okay, okay. And this gets into stuff that uh, Drew Graffia has been uh, talking about and writing about, and that is Celtic mythology, mm -hmm. because the Linean, the Le, sorry, the Linean Hydra was in a lake, a water monster inside the, the Lake of Lerna. This is uh, related to the underworld because Lerna was believed to be a portal to the other world or the underworld. Ah. And this also gets into the, uh, the, the Heracles, excuse me, the Heracles legend, his 12 labors, but also relates to Typhon, the Echidna, and the Danaeids. The huh. Danaeids, or however it's pronounced, Danaeids, uh -huh. are 50 daughters of a king. And this monster was in a lake near where they lived. Mm -hmm. And Celtic mythology says that these 50 daughters sailed to Ireland. The Tuatha the Dunan. The Dunan, yes. Huh. So w this, this was... The monster, the Hydra, that was destroyed by Hercules, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. I didn't realize that it was the Hydra of Lerna. You remember when we lived in Illinois, we lived about five miles from Lerna. Oh, my goodness. That, that <laughs> I didn't know there was a portal to the netherworld right there in we Coles County. We didn't. <laughs> but what I'm saying, the reason I bring this up is because the Septuagint writers would have known about Th this. That's very true. They were educated men, and they would have known about this. That's true. They, there are many places in the Old Testament where the um, references to the Rephaim in the Septuagint translation are connected to the titans of the Greeks and mm -hmm. the giants of the Greeks. So using their, their words, gigantes. Well, uh, we're, we're looking... We at, need to kind take of a, a break. We do, at, at kind of a unique way at uh, the prophecies of Daniel. But it's the point is... It's Gilbert way. Yeah. But, but, the, but the point is, the Jews knew what their neighbors believed, and the stories that their neighbors had heard were twisted versions mm -hmm. of what is in our scriptures. Mm -hmm. Understanding what the prophets knew about their neighbors' beliefs helps us to draw more meaning out of the Bible. And we'll continue this study in just a moment. The prophetic clock is ticking and time is running out. 
Skywatch TV is proud to present the Tipping Point special offer. When you order Jimmy Evans' new book, Tipping Point, from the Skywatch TV store, you'll also receive Dr. Thomas Horn's best-selling transhumanism expose, The Milieu, and the End Times Predictions Handbook, I Predict, which lays out the predictions of 12 global experts on what prophetic events we can expect by the year 2025 and how they will soon begin to impact our lives. From corrupt world politics and global pandemics to an unprecedented rebellion against God and His Word, humanity has reached a critical stage where we are left wondering what happens next. In his eye-opening book, Jimmy Evans uses his 45 years of experience in eschatology to examine biblical prophecies about the end times and point to their unmistakable parallels with today's world. With clear, insightful analysis of Scripture, he answers many timely questions, such as, are we actually living in the end times right now? How should believers respond to increasing immorality? Will Christians go through the tribulation? What role does Israel play in God's prophetic plan? Are COVID-19 and other world events announcing the imminent return of Jesus? You'll also receive I Predict, the End Times Prediction Manual for the coming days. Join 12 global experts such as Dr. Thomas Horn, Joel Richardson, Mark Biltz, Carl Gallups, Josh Peck, and many more as they examine extraordinary developments currently playing out in geopolitics, science, technology, and the supernatural through a biblical worldview, and what they believe will transpire before the year 2025. But that's not all. Also included in this incredible offer, you will receive The Milieu, where you will uncover why the world's top academics and futurists are identifying Dr. Thomas Horn and his milieu as the leaders of the transhuman resistance. Find out what this relentless team exposed about the rapidly approaching hybrid age and the glaring spiritual ramifications of merging man with machine that has top-level professors completely alarmed. Sold separately, these items hold a retail value over $90. Yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. So prepare for what's ahead and become a beacon of hope, peace, and encouragement for those you love in these tumultuous times we live in. This collection is available only while supplies last, so don't delay. The Tipping Point Special Offer, available now at skywatchtvstore.com. Order now or call 1-844-750-4985. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we would so love for you to join us in Turkey in October of 2022. And next March Mm -hmm. 2023, we're going to Israel. The tour of Turkey. We're going to visit the cities of the seven churches of Revelation. So this is, in a sense, an Unraveling Revelation tour of Turkey. But we're calling it the Bible's Greatest Mysteries Tour, I think. Yes. But uh, God bless Tom Horn for allowing us to go as long as we take some video that we can use to, uh, you know, show you what we've seen if you don't go with us. Uh, But do if you can, because this is going to be an amazing tour. We'll be joined by Doug Hershey, who's the best-selling author of some wonderful books that document the miraculous transformation of Israel, Israel Rising and Jerusalem Rising. And besides the churches of Revelation, we will visit Gobekli Tepe, which archaeologists call the oldest religious community on earth. Yes, and those seven churches includes Pergamon yep. and Pamukkale, which is the gate to hell. Yeah, ancient Heropolis. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, don't miss it. We'll also visit uh, Abraham's hometown of Haran and uh, a number of other interesting sites. Chattel Hoyuk, where um, th- the practice of Cranial deformation, head shaping was, and we'll talk about the possible reasons that that was. Oh, yeah, he will. (laughs) So find out more, skywatchinturkey.com, skywatchinturkey.com, or just uh, point your camera on your phone to the uh, QR code on the screen that'll take you right to the website. You're so Um, clever. Well, you know, got to keep up with the, got to keep up with the competition. Keep up with Drew. And then uh, in, in next spring, March 19th through 30th, we're looking forward to going back to the Holy Land. We will see all the sites that you'll want to see, like Nazareth, the Sea of Galilee, Jerusalem, uh, the Jordan River. We'll worship and baptize there, but we'll also go places like Joshua's Altar, Mm -hmm. Gilgal Rephaim, Shiloh, Bethel, places other tours will not. So more information on that and registration at skywatchinisrael.com. Okay, back to Daniel. Yeah, so we've got the multi-headed dragon and... You, I, I had been aware of the story of Hydra, but I had never connected that to the multi-headed 
chaos monsters of the Near East, like Yom of the Canaanites or Tiamat of the Sumerians? It's because I do research for the Red Wing Saga, and I, in the Red Wing Saga, I have a lot of spirit entities, and I try to find out what regions they control and what forms they have taken. And I try to weave that into the story. You know, again, it's a novel, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of history and a lot of Bible um, accuracy, if I want to put it that way. But what I've found in the Bible, I've tried to interpret that in the story. And uh, so we've got uh, th these, these connections then between the alternate versions of the true biblical history, God subduing Leviathan and then promising uh, Isaiah 27, verse 1, that on that day, the day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord, he will destroy Leviathan forever, which we believe is the uh, mm -hmm. reference in Revelation 21, where the sea is no more, when the new heaven and new, the new earth are established. Absolutely, and here's a bunny trail. <laughs> if the invasion, if you want to call it that, of Ireland was by a Greek uh, nationality, mm -hmm. You and I think that it's very possible that those islands were inhabited by Amorites. Mm, mm -hmm. Therefore, the Amorites took over Ireland. It's very possible. The Amorites um, are a uh, people that, that uh, dominated the time of uh, the, the ancient Near East from the time of Abraham down to the time of the Exodus. Mm -hmm. But um, their influence was felt for many, many generations afterwards. The Phoenicians, who were the the, the trading empire mm -hmm. of Tyre, uh, dominated the Mediterranean world for centuries thereafter. The Phoenicians, just no, another name for the Amorites, just yes. like Canaanite, Amorite, same ethnicity. But they went, there's good reason to believe that they made it to North America. Yes. Uh, there's a... Uh, America's Stonehenge in, in uh, New Hampshire. There, there's in their, their little museum there. There's a stone inscribed. Yes. Yeah, st an inscribed stone. So again, that, sorry about the bunny trail. I couldn't help it. But uh, the spirit entities were at war with one another back yes. then. They are, are at war with one another right now. Right. They will come together insofar as they is their rebellion against God. Um, w w is is still ongoing, mm -hmm. but uh, we read in Revelation that uh, in Revelation 17, where John gets the explanation of what that seven-headed beast coming out of the sea in Revelation 13 is all about. Mm -hmm. This again is a description of the Antichrist, and um, this in Revelation 17 is where you see the woman sitting on that beast, and that is as you. I think argued convincingly, Inanna, the yes. ancient Sumerian goddess of sex and war. And isn't it interesting that in the Septuagint we get the first beast that may well be Inanna? Yeah, as a, the lioness, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that would be a. a she was a very popular mm -hmm. deity. She really has never really lost her popularity. I think she's in throughout control all of now. History. I really do. Um, so John asks in, in Revelation 13, what's going on in, the, in verse 7, but the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. I believe that uh, Leviathan chaos still influences the world, but it is currently mm -hmm. like the other rebellious uh, fallen Elohim from the sons of God from Genesis 6, um, as Peter described them, the sinning angels mm -hmm. chained in gloomy darkness until the final judgment. Um, the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now that's yes. one reason that Rome has been that, that some interpret this as at Rome and the Roman Catholic uh, Church. And just as with depicting Gog of Magog as Russia after mm -hmm. the Bolshevik Revolution and after World War II, especially during the Cold War, this was a very popular interpretation beginning with the uh, Protestant Reformation. Well, in your book, The Great Inception, you get into the idea of mountains mm -hmm. not necessarily being literal hills in a city, but that they represent a, a council of deities. Yeah, yeah. Or sometimes the actual deity. Right. Because in as we've discussed here in this program, the book of Enoch, 1 Enoch, describes 
the uh, the rebellious angels as mountains. It's First Enoch twenty, if I remember correctly, where Enoch is shown these mountains that are on fire in the underworld, mm-hmm. and uh, he said, "Well, yeah, these are the angels who have rebelled." And and isn't so, it interesting that there's a prophecy of a great mountain? Yes, we talked about that uh, yeah. in our discussion of uh, that section of Revelation mm, eight. Uh, yeah, we think that the flaming mountain that hits the sea is an entity rather than an asteroid. So uh, these seven mountains on which the woman is seated, yes, I would argue that that's a really good interpretation. These are seven spirits that are supporting that that chaos it's a entity. Coalition. It's a coalition. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. So again, that's the eighth who is of the seven. Mm-hmm. Um and I, I know there's, there's been interpretations that have looked at human rulers in the past, like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, Nimrod, the Pharaoh of the mm-hmm. Exodus, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And that uh, some even have looked at this into our modern day and said that the eighth might have been, or, or the seventh, it might have been Adolf Hitler, possibly. But again, we think that these represent spirit beings, Elohim, mm-hmm. uh, small e Elohim, of course. Um, the horns, the ten horns, let's see, uh, as for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, yes. and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. Again, We're going to have to actually tackle the ten kings next yeah, week, because yeah. that's a huge topic. It is, but uh, and there's been some very interesting interpretations on it. Gary Stearman, who thankfully we hear is recovering from yes. uh, having a pacemaker. Well, athletic. yeah, I thought, if you've not heard that, at the time that we're recording this, and today is the 20th of February, mm-hmm. yep. um, he had a pacemaker put in yesterday. He's doing much, much better. Yep. He not felt well for a while, but if your heart's not beating correctly... Yes, you won't. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. but uh, Gary was on Skywatch TV back in the fall, and uh, he put forth the theory, and I think this is a very interesting interpretation, that the ten kings who have not yet received royal power are in, are not kings of nation states, but they are tech oligarchs. And we've seen the influence of the tech companies, big tech, in the past couple of years, you the way they control and shape the narrative. Really interesting. Well, if you find that interesting just the way I do, tune in next week. Yeah, we will continue our discussion of the uh, ten kings and try to suss this out because... You know, the seven heads are seven kings, and the beast is an eighth, but he's of the seven. And then on his heads, he's got ten more kings. And uh, and then why does he? Why does the beast in, in Revelation 13, when he comes out, he's got diadems. Diadems yes. on the horns, whereas Satan, who's also a seven-headed beast, has diadems on the heads. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. We will unpack that for you next week. To the but best of our meantime, ability, we're not promising any final answers here either. Because we, we're trying to figure it out just the way you are. Yeah. We're not going to say we know this, this, and this. There are a few things that we do know. But other than that, we are truly just trying to suss out the truth. Amen to that. And uh, we thank you for watching as we continue this journey. This is Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. Unraveling Revelation is part of Skywatch TV. To learn more about Skywatch TV and the work of our sister ministry, Whispering Ponies Ranch, please visit our website, skywatchtv.com. And please join us for our weekly study of the Bible, verse by verse in chronological order, online at gilberthouse.org.